George Beadle and Edward Tatum hypothesized that genes determine the functionality of enzymes, and they set out to provide experimental proof of the connections between genes and enzymes. And they hypothesized that one gene led to one enzyme. And if this were true, it should be possible to create genetic mutants that are unable to carry out specific enzyme reactions. To test this theory, they exposed spores of bread mold to x-rays or UV radiation and studied the resulting mutations. The mutant molds had a variety of special nutritional needs. Unlike their normal counterparts, they could not live without the addition of a particular vitamins or amino acids to their food. Genetic analysis showed that each mutant differed from the original normal type by only one gene. These results led them to the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, which states that each gene is responsible for directly building a single specific enzyme. Three years later, Adrian Serb and Norman Horowitz conducted a rigorous test of the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. They did this by examining the production of a specific amino acid, arginine, in the bread mold. Normal cells can grow in the absence of arginine. This is because they can synthesize their own. Previous work had indicated that the production of arginine in bread mold takes place in three steps. A precursor molecule changes three times prior to becoming arginine, and Serb and Horowitz hypothesized that different genes lead to the synthesis of each enzyme which changes the molecules. To test this idea, Serb and Horowitz used radiation to create a large number of mutant individuals. Radiation is known to damage the structure of DNA. However, it's difficult to control which part of the DNA is damaged. So they did this with a bunch of bread molds and conducted genetic screening to pick particular types of mutants and isolated individuals with mutations in one or more of the genes for the enzymes shown in the slide. To test the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, the biologists grew the mutants in a normal medium that lacked arginine and were supplemented either with nothing, ornithine, cyrilline, or arginine. Some of the mutant cells were able to grow in some of the media but not others. And even more, if an intermediate enzyme was not created, none of the previous enzymes were made. This experiment convinced most investigators of the validity of the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. In other words, genes make enzymes. And enzymes are proteins. But very soon the question became, how does a gene create a protein? Francis Crick proposed that the sequence of bases in DNA might act as sort of a code. He thought that DNA served as a blueprint for the information that is used to specify specific amino acid sequence in proteins. However, it soon became apparent that the information encoded in the base sequence of DNA is not translated into the amino acid sequence of proteins directly. Instead, RNA serves as an intermediary between DNA and proteins. Francois Jacob and Jacques Monod were the first to suggest that RNA molecules act as a link between genes and proteins. They hypothesized that short-lived bits of RNA, which they called messenger RNA, carry information from DNA to the site of protein synthesis, the ribosomes. Central dogma is all about the flow of information. DNA goes to RNA and RNA goes to proteins. The copying of DNA to RNA is known as transcription. And if you're taking notes right now, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking the information into your brain and transcribing it onto paper. Translation, on the other hand, takes a message and creates an actual product. So if DNA were the architect, the protein would be the building, and the mRNA would be nothing more than a blueprint. In the next lecture, we'll dive into the details of transcription and translation, but this is enough for now. This is most likely a review at this point, but it's important to understand. An organism's genotype is determined by the sequence of nitrogenous bases in DNA. In other words, what are the orders of the A, C, T's, and G's? A phenotype is a product of those proteins. And as Beadle and Tatum hypothesized, one gene, in fact, does determine a single enzyme. And an enzyme is nothing more than a functional protein. And alleles are different versions of a gene. Just like Michael Moore and Rush Limbaugh are the same species, but man, are they different. More specifically, there are different DNA sequence possibilities for a single gene. And those different DNA sequences produced different proteins. And different proteins have the potential 
to produce different phenotypes. In other words, genotypes create phenotypes. DNA creates proteins. Let's see that in action. In populations of mice, some individuals have a gene that determines the color of the mouse. As you can see, there's a point mutation at a single base pair. That changes the final product of the protein, and the protein determines the color. Where a dark mouse would have an arginine amino acid in the gene, the white mouse has a cysteine amino acid. This single change in the DNA molecule is enough to cause a change in the phenotype of the mouse, dark versus white fur. Messenger RNA is just one of seven major different types of RNA. Some are also involved in protein synthesis, like transfer RNA, and DNA directly codes for these RNA molecules. So the information flows, in this case, would be simply DNA to RNA. So the final product is RNA, not necessarily protein. In the other major exception to this dogma, the information flow is reversed. Some viruses, for example, have genes composed of RNA. When these viruses infect a cell, the viral RNA synthesizes DNA. So in this way, the information flow would be from RNA to DNA. These are known as reverse transcriptase viruses, and HIV is a commonly known example of one. But even though there's exceptions to the dogma, the central dogma of molecular biology encompasses the most important flow of information for all life on Earth. DNA codes for RNA, and that RNA codes for proteins. Once biologists understood the dogma, they understood the general pattern of information flow in a cell. The next challenge was to understand how the sequence of bases in a strand of messenger RNA code for the sequence of amino acids in a protein. This is known as the genetic code, or the rules that specify the relationship between the sequence of nucleotides in DNA and the sequence of amino acids in a protein. George Gamal suggested a code based on logic. He suggested that each code word contains three bases. His reasoning was based on the observation that there are 20 amino acids. Since there are only four base pairs and 20 amino acids, a combination of base pairs was required to code for the amino acids. If amino acid was based on a single nucleotide, then there'd only be four amino acids. So Gamal surmised that the code could not be represented by even a combination of two nucleotides either, because four times four is 16, and there are 20 amino acids. Gamal suggested that the code must be based on a three-base code, now known as a triplet code, because it's the simplest code that allows for the 20 known amino acids to exist. But 4 times 4 times 4 equals 64. This suggests that there could be up to 64 unique amino acids, but there's only 20. Therefore, Gamal suggested that the genetic code could be redundant. That is, more than one triplet of bases might specify the same amino acid. The group of three bases that specifies a particular amino acid is called a codon, and according to Gamal's triplet hypothesis, each codon is made of three nucleotides. And each gene is defined by a start codon and a stop codon. The start codon has been identified and is the same codon for every single gene of every single organism on Earth. In contrast, there are three stop codons. Once biologists had cracked the genetic code, they realized that it had a series of important properties. As Gamal had suggested, it is redundant. This means that amino acids can be coded for by more than one codon. The second property of the code is that the code is unambiguous. This means that the same codon always codes for the same amino acid. Thirdly, the code is universal. With very few exceptions, all codons specify the same amino acids in all the organisms on Earth. This is another line of evidence that suggests that all organisms on Earth today share common ancestors, from bacteria to bananas. And lastly, the code is conservative. This means that when several codons specify for the same amino acid, the first two bases of those codons are usually identical. This last point is subtle yet important. If a mutation in DNA occurs in the third position, it's relatively unlikely that it's going to change the amino acid in the final protein. This feature makes organisms less vulnerable to small random changes in DNA. Using the genetic code, we can predict the codons and amino acid sequence encoded by a DNA sequence. If you understand how to read the genetic code, you should be able to do several things. 
First, you should be able to identify the codons coded by the DNA sequence. Remember that a gene always starts with a start codon. In mRNA, it's AUG, but in DNA, it's TAC. And TAC in DNA codes for AUG, the mRNA. Second, you should be able to predict the amino acid sequence coded for by the codons. I suggest pausing the video at this time and determining whether or not you can predict how the mRNA was transcribed and how the codons determine the amino acids in this example. You'll get an opportunity to try an example by yourself in the next slide. Using the bottom strand of the DNA sequence in this slide, determine both the messenger RNA sequence and the amino acid sequence. You can determine the amino acid sequence using this amino acid wheel or the amino acid table in your textbook. Go ahead and pause the video and try to solve this problem. All right, here are the answers. Go ahead and pause the video and compare them with yours. Once you understand the code, you begin to realize how truly elegant it is. Mutations are permanent changes in the organism's DNA, a modification of the cell's information archive, if you will. And mutations are really important in evolution because they're the only known mechanism that actually creates new alleles. Sex is nothing more than a recombination of existing alleles. Mutations actually create new alleles. And new alleles have the potential to produce new genotypes, and new genotypes produce new phenotypes. And there are two basic kinds of mutations. Point mutations are when a single nucleotide changes, and chromosome level mutations occur with the addition or deletion of entire chromosomes. Point mutations occur when DNA's proofreading mechanism fails to correct a mismatched base pair before replication, and this results in a single base change. And there are two resultant consequences of point mutations. Point mutations that result in a change in the amino acid sequence are known as replacement or missense mutations, whereas silent mutations are point mutations that don't change the amino acid sequence. And these are most common when the third nucleotide is changed in a codon. An organism's fitness is its ability to live and reproduce, its ability to survive and then produce viable offspring. And mutations can either affect an organism's fitness or not. Mutations that increase fitness are termed beneficial, whereas those that decrease fitness are said to be deleterious. Mutations that have no effect on an organism's fitness are said to be neutral, and are commonly silent mutations. Most mutations are neutral or slightly deleterious. There are several different types of chromosome level mutations. There are those that change the number of chromosomes in a cell and those that change the composition of specific chromosomes. In certain circumstances, the entire karyotype can be copied and still produce a functional individual. This is a common feature in plants and is known as polyploidy. And it's also possible for an entire chromosome to be added or deleted and is known as aneuploidy. Down syndrome is an example of aneuploidy. And it's where an entire chromosome is deleted from the human genome. The more common chromosome level mutations are changes in the segments of DNA. In inversion, a segment of DNA gets separated from the chromosomes, it rotates, and then rejoins the same chromosome. Whereas in translocation, a section of DNA breaks and attaches to another chromosome, or in a different part of the same chromosome. Here's an example of chromosome level mutations. On the left is a normal human karyotype, and on the right is a karyotype of a cancerous cell from a human. Can you see the evidence of polyploidy, aneuploidy, as well as translocation? 